Uh, yeah, I'm doing um, the class I'm doing. How are we doing? You got in frame. You can move it to the back if you want, or further back. Um, the, cla uh, the class I'm doing that's like basically for the public is um, the business class that I'm offering you guys plus a bunch of other modules. It's a f the full course that I had designed. It's a 12-week course, twice a week, four hours a class. It's eight hours a week. Um, the business plan that I'm requiring for that class is a full comprehensive business plan. I'm actually requiring a lot less comprehensive one for you guys. Um, the one that I'm looking for for them is like 40 to 60 pages, full research, all that stuff. And what we do is we, we uh, I have everything from you know resources coming in, talking about marketing. I have like five days talking about marketing, and I have like four days talking about financials, and I have, um, it's just a really, really nice class. If you want to sign up for it and want to do that, that's fine. Um, but you'll have to, if you want to get the grant and all that stuff, you have to do it through KPFA. Um, and the other one ends November 23rd, which is, I think, about five weeks before th this one ends. So it's much more comprehensive. Than it's every Tuesday. Five Tuesday and six. Actually, OK. The KPFA one is Tuesday nights from 5 o'clock till 9. For how long? For I think four hours. Four hours. No, from August 6th to. It goes to like October 1st, I think, is the last date. Well, if I'm getting that right, I'm pretty good because like, <laughs> my schedule's ridiculous. Um, you know what I mean, sir? I'll tell you. I, I will, if I start signing up for a class, uh -huh. I was already weeks because I went on one special vacation that I had planned for months ago. So. Okay, you, I'm offering the same thing with the video, so you don't have to show up for class. You can do the do the video stuff. Um, it's going to be a little bit different requirement. I'm not going to have really homeworks in the sense that we have sheets here. It's going to be I'm going to require the different modules that I'm going to talk about of the business plan. So like the first day is going to be uh, talking about your your um, business model. So at the next week, I want your whole entire business model finished within that next week, and then um, I'll probably go into financials next to give you plenty of time to work on those. Um, so then the next week I want at least a rough draft of your entire financial plan. Um, so what it comes down to is the KPFA class, as reduced as it is, will still take you, no BS, at least 12 hours a week outside of class, plus the four hours in class. It is intense. It is hands-on. You, if you don't commit the time to do it, you're going to fall behind. And, and just like you saw in the homeworks, it's like it's impossible to catch up. So um, I'm basically requiring a 20 to 30 page business plan done in five or six, seven weeks. So you have to commit to this class for those seven weeks like it's your second job. Um, and that's how we're weeding out who's going to be a real contributor to the KPFA program and who's going to actually be farming out there and then who's just talk. So we're really trying to figure out who, who that is. And I know that it, within this group right now, we have almost everybody's ready to rock. You just, you're all doing the homework, and you're all doing it really, really well. And it's, a, it's night and day compared to the other class that I had. So I'm really, really proud of you guys, and I want you to stay involved and just know that it's a lot of work. When I do, after the business class, I'm going to do those separate modules where it's like natural farming, composting, maybe some budgeting. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think there's grant money for it. But if uh, KPFA, right? And then KPFA, we show the success that we have here, and then we go in for another um, grant, then there's probably a chance that we can get a much bigger grant, and then we can continue this. So um, what we would need is like testimonials, right, from the students, how successful it was for you. And then we actually show that you guys put stuff in the ground based on your business plan. So once, once everybody completes it, yeah, the, the goal would be if you guys stick with it the whole time and then we can have people finished, then this, hopefully this program could go on for a very long time. But it just takes people asking for more and more money every other year or every year. Right? Mm -hmm. So we've had people come down and look at, look 
So the gift keeps on giving if you stick with it, basically. I heard that from a Marvel student. I like that catchphrase that you were mentioning. You look good, too. Oh, don't worry about me. I always look good. <laughs> honestly, honestly, guys, this KPFA thing was kind of like a side thing that we kind of got tossed and like, hey, can you help us out? And I, I already had this program already set up. And so I just kind of like geared it towards your group. So um, I'm so successful with the other stuff that I'm doing that even if I failed in here, it would be all right. <laughs> <laughs> I just get paid hourly, man. I get paid hourly and I work my butt off all week long. That's all I do. Uh, then there's a big fat bonus if I succeed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get nothing if you succeed or not. I get my hourly wage. I'm a state employee. I get days off more than the average person because <laughs> I'm a state employee. But then again, I use that for thesis. OK, it is an hour late. So I hope to get through this. If I end up skipping through a few things, then that's you know why. Um, and then I really hope to get to the activity because that's super important. Everybody read your, your write-ups, right? At least the one that talks about d disease identification, right? So before I even start, and I asked, what would be one trait of a fungus inf infestation? Go ahead, answer. So rust is, OK, rust is interesting. It's funny you bring that up. Rust is actually an algae, but it behaves like a fungus. So yes, you have spots. Um, so like a, it would actually look similar to a fungus, but it's actually not a fungus. But yeah, spots. So fungus will usually have a, a circular spot versus um, kind of just desiccation of the leaf. So just that understanding of that simple thing alone, you should be 10 times more successful than you were at identifying diseases. So, um, so be sure that while we're flipping through and I'm going through this, that you guys really, really rush up on that stuff so that when we do the uh, lab, um, we can roll right through it and everybody understands what's going on. OK, I hope I don't block your view standing over here. We OK over there on camera? Everybody's alive. Integrated pest management, folks. I'm not getting you in this now. That's OK. I'm pretty. I know it. OK, so let me see if I can get this. Nobody fall asleep on me, OK? All right, integrated pest management. We're going to talk about IPM specifically. What is an integrated pest management? What is uh, involved in a plan um, to basically tie everything together as far as your pest management? We're going to talk about weed control management, insect pest management, disease control management, and then abiotic environmental management. What does abiotic mean again? Something not from living material? Yeah, not alive. So wind and uh, sun and, and things like that. OK? So I'm going to all day today be asking you a lot of questions. And I hope somebody can just belt me out an answer as soon as possible. I don't care who it is, OK? Um, this is my, my, my call and response day, all right? What is IPM? Well, it's defined as an integrated approach of crop management to solve ecological problems when applied to agriculture. OK, let's look at that. Integrated approach, meaning? What is integrated? All encompassing. A lot of things brought together, right? Um, so we're talking about weeds and insects and abiotic factors and you know, plant diseases, all these things all brought together. Approach looking at crop management to solve ecological problems when applied to agriculture. The ecological problems, um, basically what it comes down to is any farmer can go out and just spray a chemical and kill the fungus that's on his plant. But with an integrated pest management uh, plan, a farmer will consider what are the ecological effects of what they do on their farm. So it's taking a approach of um, an environmental stance as, yeah, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm killing my fungus, and I'm growing wonderful tomatoes, but how does that affect 
around me, my neighbors, my water, um, runoff, all those wonderful things. Okay, so all encompassing, all these things brought together. Goals of integrated pest management is to mitigate pest disease while protecting human health, the environment, and economic viability. So, kill the pests, or at least not kill the pests, but address the issue of the pests, and then um, at the same time making sure that humans stay healthy and the environment stays clean and um, we don't have toxic water, which would cause an economic problem for us or something like that, okay? Um, be adaptable to diverse management approaches. So in an integrated pest management plan, uh, having more than one approach or um, contingencies of many, many kinds is really the goal. Okay? Your IPM plan should have essentially, if anything goes wrong, you should already have a plan for addressing whatever that problem is. It goes pretty deep in doing research on what kind of insects and pests exist in your environment writing up treatment plans and putting them into your, biz, into your IPM plan so that when it does eventually happen, you already have a plan. But we'll get into that. It's also influenced by diversity of public and private values. Um, public values being, in Hawaii, a little bit different than the mainland, especially when you get into like the Midwest and whatever. A lot of farmers out there have absolutely no concern about using chemicals, Monsanto sprays, all that stuff. It's organic and all that stuff is really not all that popular in the Midwest because it's hard to make money and it's hard to do large scale farming on it. Plus almost all the farmers that use those products um, survive off subsidy checks. So they get paid from the government to not grow corn and wheat and, and, and soy. So we're talking about different values here. So your IPM plan might be different in Iowa than it would be in Hawaii. So it's really kind of based on um, the attitudes of the public around you. Uh, so in California, your IPM plan would be much stricter than if you were in any other state for the most part because they have very, very, very strict plans and using chemicals and all that stuff. Um, and so you have to adhere with your goal of your IPM to the public and private values uh, of the people around you and um, of the public interest. Components of an IPM plan. All right, guys, I'm telling you about the different pieces that go into an I IPM plan. Planning. Planning during IPM um, design is certainly important because it allows you to take a proactive approach. Meaning, like I said, you have something written up for every contingency, every single thing that could go wrong in your farm, you already have it in your binder of your IPM book. And that is, um, you, you have little tabs on there, it's like aphids, aphids have attacked my plants, what is my farm plan? Okay, based upon my values and the values of the, the public around me, um, what, is, what is gonna be my approach? And because of my stance, it's going to be natural, it's going to be organic, and I already have a, a write-up inside my IPM plan that says, if I have aphids, this is what I'm going to do. So that when we find the aphids, you don't have to go figure out what you got to do. You got to acquire whatever chemicals or whatever. You, have, you just go right to the book, and you go, what do I do? Okay, so that's what we're talking about, IPM plan. It's an actual manual. It's an actual booklet of contingencies. Um, it allows you to anticipate problems. So in that booklet, you'll notice, and after all the research that you do, um, as a farmer, knowing all the types of bugs that would be in your environment or whatever kinds of diseases or weeds might be in your environment, uh, allows you to know that, say, if you see aphids, there's a chance there's gonna be ants because ants harvest aphids. So you would anticipate problems by Noticing you have aphids, going to your IPM book, and your IPM book says, hey, if you have aphids, chances are it's, it's the ants that are the problem. They're, they're hurting them like cows and bringing them all over your plants. So maybe address the ants, and then you don't have to address the aphids. So you're anticipating already how to address problems that don't even exist yet. 
Uh, allows a farmer to take advantage of uh, all available options. Um, if a farmer has a disease issue, say some sort of root knot nematode, um, there are several approaches that somebody might want to take. And actually, you probably want to use two or three at a time to make sure that you combat your, your, the problem with your nematodes. Um, having all options in a booklet in case one plan doesn't work, or say that uh, you want to fumigate the nematodes in your soil, but you can't because you've got beets in the soil right now. And you got to, in three weeks, you can do that after you harvest. But right now, you need to make sure that your beets don't have those root knot nematodes. So you have a different approach in your booklet than if you have crop in the ground or if you don't. And when do you actually see um, evidence of the root knot nematode? Um, is it when you do your soil sample and you do it, send it in for analysis? Or is it when you pull out your beets and you notice that there's root knots all over it? So that you literally have a plan for each thing that can go wrong at each phase of growth, at each you know, point. Planning, planning, planning. Plan ahead. Um, allows a, a farmer to know his or her objective. Well, is, is the approach that the farmer is taking um, based upon the need to save money or the need to improve or not ruin the environment? So a lot of farmers will take the stance and say, my IPM plan is written to save me money okay. with limited pro, uh, um, environmental issues. But it, it, it's, the core of it is to make sure that I save money. And then there's another guy over here in Pune who doesn't really care how much money he's making. He just wants to make sure that he's, he's helping out the environment and he's making the place better than when he got there. So that's his IPM plan. His IPM plan is probably much bigger, much more detailed, because you have all these contingencies. This guy uses chemicals, and he's able to just you know, take this approach, this approach, this approach. And so his might be a little bit smaller. But either way, it allows you to um, figure out what your objective is and base your plan on your objective. Save money, help the environment. Most IPM planners are more informed than those who are not planners. If you write an IPM plan, well, first of all, your IPM plan should never stop being drafted. The day you start your IPM plan is the day you start researching. And the day you start learning about your environment and your land and the biology that is involved there. So most chances, uh, most planners that go out into the field who have already done the research and know that whatever, that the ants harvest the aphids, They've already done this research. They can go out into the field, and they don't have to consult their book. They already remember that I've already done the research, and they can really act on it right away. And they don't have to go back and look it up. You know how like when you write things down, you tend to remember it? It's kind of that theory. If you draft this book, and you start putting it together, chances are you're actually going to learn that stuff. <laughs> and then you don't really need the book so much. But you always want to refer back to it, but it's all, it's all up here. So those people are more informed. They actually put in the work. Now, five years, 10 years into having your farm, you should never stop writing that IPM plan because chances are you're getting new pests, you're getting uh, invasive species, you're getting all kinds of things brought in from all over the world every year, and you really need to keep up on it and know what potential problems might happen year after year. Okay? Um, planning allows uh, collecting current and historical information about the situation site and past. So if you continuously build your IPM plan, you're constantly getting in touch with CTAR to find out the new data on the fire ants and that kind of thing. Or you're, you're finding out about um, um, cabbage moths and how this year we have a different, somebody's come up with a different approach for cabbage moths. So, Consistently going back to CTAR, you're, you're actually collecting the most current stuff and probably most likely the stuff that works the best. Um, it allows you to address short and long-term strategies. Well, if you come, up, come upon land and it ha needs to be cleared out and you don't even have a farm there yet, your IPM plan is going to be different than when you finally do do a crop. 
So it allows you to um, look into preventing insects from infesting your area or disease infesting your area while you're clearing your land. So taking that type of proactive approach where before you've even started your farm, you've already taken steps to keep bad things out. Um, that's sh short term and then you have your long term strategies. How can that help keep insects and disease out when you finally do your crop? So you clear out your land and the first thing you do is you put a, you know, a border around your, your property, bamboo or vibe or something, where it's very hard for insects to break through that barrier and get onto your land. Well, you know that you're going to set that up before you even start planting, okay? I'm going to turn the lights on soon if everybody keeps falling asleep. <laughs> We're in like seventh slide and I'm losing folks. I got a question. Yeah. Most, most information would be on CTAR's website. Um, there's, and I was supposed to tell you about it last class and I didn't. Um, there's a, if you go to the CTAR website, there is crop write-ups for pretty much every single crop out there uh, that they grow in Hawaii on a large scale. And so CTAR is pretty much how to grow tomatoes. Where do they grow best and what soil, it has all the descriptions, what bugs and, and diseases tend to get on your plants, blah, 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 blah. So you can actually know that I'm going to be a tomato farmer, so I would actually find that right up uh, from CTAR, which tells me what insects tend to cause economic problems for tomato production, and then you reference that. So you know how you said um, plant the border so the insects don't come in? Yeah. Like things like that, we'll just learn along the way from people, or is there a place, a site, or a book uh, that you recommend that's, tricks like that? That's farm management. Um, I would say, Take a class at UH. Um, introduction to agriculture would probably be the, probably the best step there. And that would be really tell, teach you about farm management. Oh, one of the modules that we're doing is Zach teaching um, farm management class. So maybe get in with him when he teaches that module. Um, it's really all about education and you, nobody set that up for you. It really, it's, you have to go find that stuff. Um, most farmers don't think about border control when they build their farms. To me, the first thing I'm going to do when I, if I get a farm is border control and erosion control and, um, and uh, trying to keep out pests while I'm designing my, my plan. So it's just something that you learn along the way, I guess. At the beginning of class, you said uh, you could pay you to come on and set that up for you. Is that still an option? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I do. It, <laughs> I'm not putting it. If you guys want to take advantage, I would always say call your uh, extension agent first because that's what the state has put up in there. I'm a private entity, and if you want to do that, that's fine. I do charge $45 an hour. Question? Okay. Um, get with your extension agent. They will do it for free. Or you can have me come in in like three hours and answer all your questions, and it costs you about 100 and some odd bucks. Okay. Setting action thresholds. Well, what is a threshold in IPM? Well, I would describe it as at what point do you do something about it? Right? So you got a little bit of fungus on your citrus tree, but you're, you keep rocking out these huge oranges. Awesome. At what point does that fungus? become a problem for you economically and as a farmer. So we're talking about the threshold when you actually take action. All right? So you're going to write that in your IPM plan uh, for each crop. What would be the threshold before you actually act? All right? Some of them might be the first bug you see, the first leaf spot, like circospora and things like that tends to spread pretty quickly by splashing of water. I would recommend as soon as you see that, you act. You know, aphids on the other hand, or um, cabbage butterflies, get on there. Eh. If your cucumbers are already cucumbers and you're two weeks from harvesting and you got cabbage butterfly all over it, who cares? You're just going to harvest in a couple days anyway. It's not a big deal. So why spray chemicals all over your harvest, right? So talk about thresholds here. It's based upon your values, your priorities, your economics, what health issues 
um, you want to address and environmental impacts that determine when you intervention will occur. Okay, so this is your thresholds usually be different for every farmer. Uh, a balance of perspective, pest damage, control costs, and any health or environmental liabilities or management actions. Um, it, like it says, it's a balance of all of those things. Uh, has the pest damage gotten so bad that you're going to have to dump money into your crop? Um, or can you just let it wait out? Understanding what your crop is and what the insect is is, is probably the most important part of this. Because if you know that the cabbage butterfly typically won't go on the fruit, um, they usually just eat the leaves, then you can address that. Like, it's okay. I only have a week left till, till I harvest. So um, it allows, it mitigates the emotional reactive response to managing the problems. Um, it's, this is, this is, hits close to home for me. I'm pretty reactive. Uh, when it comes to disease and pests, like if I see insects on something that I've been growing for like a cow or something, if I see fungus on there, then I've been working on that cow for a year. <laughs> I, it's like, I can't sleep. <laughs> I just, it's all I'm thinking about. It's like, why did I put all this time in for there to be um, fungus eating my tomatoes, right? So um, it prevents me from getting emotional response and doing something stupid. Because the book says, until you see 20% of the plant is damaged, or whatever my threshold is, if I, until I see uh, 15 aphids on a plant, then I don't do anything. Then it, I look at the book, I go, I can't do anything. I only see 12. <laughs> Got to wait till 15. And, and really, it allows you to, um, you know, it mitigates the emotional response, the reactive response. So you have to go with what's in the book because that's what science has told you that will actually cause damage to your plants, not your emotions. And your emotions can be very expensive because you can go out there and start spraying stuff and putting stuff down or um, if nothing else expensive in when you're thinking about time. So you, gotta, you spend your whole day going out there putting mulch out to get rid of the, the corn worm. You know, you spend all day doing that when, in fact, there's nothing you can do to prevent the corn worm in Hawaii. You just have to chop the end of your corn up. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, unnecessary management efforts waste, like I said, time, money, energy, and have undesirable health and environmental consequences. Um, some insecticides really need to be done on a, on a broad scale. Um, if you have a small patch and you go in and you spray that one area, um, a lot of times there needs to be the right concentration, the right airflow, and you can cause co toxic um, conditions for your plants if you're not applying it on a large enough scale. So that's really with the conventional stuff. Um, I don't know how many folks are going to be using nasty sprays, but that certainly comes into play with that. Um, Inaction results in pest damage and loss. So on the reverse side, if you don't do anything, you will have problems. So it'll, it'll tell you, you, the plan will tell you that once 20% of the plant is damaged, that you have to do something. You can't, in, this, in the reverse of the emotional response, there's kind of people that are passive that are just like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, don't worry about it, it's fine. Come out the next day, it looks worse, it's okay, it's okay, don't worry about it, because they're lazy or they want to spend money. And it turns out that they sh really should have done something because the IPM plan says once 10% of your tomato plant starts dying, chances are you probably have a, a phloem disease and that will kill your plant overnight, okay? Uh, defining what constitutes damage, super important. Like I said, what's, what's damage for one person versus another? An organic farmer might notice cabbage moths all over his thing and be like, whatever, it's fine. Um, and another guy might say uh, that's them being there is considered damage. So it allows you to get a definition of your values, um, like I had said earlier. Boy. Monitoring and detection. You got to go out into your field and look at your plants. 
Plain and simple. Um, <clears throat> I'll read it.